Welcome to the Everything is a Primary Source podcast, the show where history is learned through pop culture. I'm your host, Eric Paul. Photographer Roland Sherman may not have as recognizable a name as some of his subjects, but you have seen his work. His photographs of the Beatles, Janis Joplin, Arthur Ashe, Bob Dylan, Woodstock, Lyndon B. Johnson, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and the 1963 March on Washington have graced galleries, textbooks, postcards, films, television, album covers, and other media since they were taken. Each one of his photographs are indelible documents of such a vibrant and visual time period. You know from listening to this show that when something is looked at as a primary source, it is important to ask who made it. Unfortunately, through a number of circumstances, and for a variety of reasons, Roland Sherman's name has often been unattached to his work. Enter Michael E. Jones. Among his many distinguished accomplishments, Michael is a lawyer and professor of legal principles in the fields of the arts and entertainment. After befriending Roland, Michael and his wife, Christine Jones, set to work putting the record straight on who took these famous pictures, without which our understanding of America in the 1960s would be that much less. The product of their efforts is the book Timeless, Photography of Roland Sherman, a copy of which I picked up earlier this year and inspired the interview with Roland and Michael you are about to hear. Um, so the first idea that I want to bring in front of you is the relationship between law government and the role in the arts, particularly for photography. So Roland, you were saying that you, depending on who is giving you the employment, you know, to, to take photographs, that there is a bit of a trade-off that you had to do with your intellectual property um, that took place. Yes. Well, let's see. We're talking about uh, 61. JFK makes that speech about what you can do for your country. And uh, I was charmed by him and by what the, by the idea of the Peace Corps. And I immediately went to D.C. and invented the job of photographer for the Peace Corps, which I thought, you know, this this is this story. I've, I've told this so many times, but it's one of it's one of those things that it, not only did I do something for my country, it, it made my career. I mean, I, I, I got a job that sent me around the world photographing the Peace Corps at work in dozens of countries, you know, Hong Kong and Sumatra and Thailand, all over Africa, India, and so forth. And so at the age of 24 or something like that, without really knowing anything going in, I came out with like a terrific portfolio that it's hard to match a, a kid like my age could hardly match a portfolio that's traveled so well and had so many uh, tear sheets and so forth because it really made my career. The flip I, side, I, when I went to kind of get my negatives, you know, no, no, the, the government owns those negatives. So it was the government work is it was one thing, and the fact that I made my career is something else. So it's, yeah, uh, right at it's the beginning, that because I, I see a lot of parallels between the Peace Corps and, um, of course, later on, AmeriCorps, but before that, the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 1930s. And um, the the federal government employed a lot of photographers throughout the 30s, didn't they, as a way to document New Deal programs? That's sure an interesting that... point. They certainly did. And the guys that they hired were all the, became the, the iconic pillars of the pantheon of photography. You know, Gordon Parks among them. And well, I know there's Dorothea Lang. She always stands. Dorothea there. Lang is uh, awfully, and... yeah. Michael, you know, I, I, I was wondering. Because uh, you mentioned in, in the book Timeless about the Supreme Court ruling in 1884 um, and then with uh, the 1991 legislation, how do those two acts of government reflect how popularized photography was was becoming in those times? Well, what, what you have what you have to look at, you have to start with the Constitution that, that gives Congress uh, the power and the authority and the motivation to recognize the arts. And in a sense, it's a monopoly right when somebody creates a work of art. And then the question is, how do we define art? 
And there was a time, as Roland knows, and Eric, you probably know too, that people thought the camera was was the death of art because it could realistically portray images in, in a fashion better than any any pencil drawing or any paintbrush. Um, but we we began to accept it as a different form, a different medium of art. So by by legislation, by statute, um, the works of photographers like Roland and, and Robert Frank and Arno Minkinen were recognized as intellectual property and they belonged to the person who created the art. In other words, the one who had the camera and pushed the little button as the case may be. And that's that's still the case. Now, where it gets complicated is, um, you know, are, are, whether you're, if you're an employee for somebody and they put you on assignment, your employer owns that artwork. Uh, Roland, I don't know, was ever really an employee. He, for the most part, was a freelance photographer, whether uh, especially for Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post and Paris Marsh and all the other magazines he worked for. So the question that what the law basically now says, and at one point it didn't say it was complicated, but even if you're a freelance photographer, you own the right to your work. So anyway, so, you know, for a lot of Roland's work that somehow filtered into the public domain to some, even though it's reproduced and you can find it, you know, in a Google search um, all, all across the world, many of those images belong to Roland, <laughs> Uh, even though people reproduce them, just because you reproduce them and copy them doesn't mean that you own the copyright to them. In some cases, Roland still owns those copyrights. My role, which I presume, Eric, you're going to get to in terms of my wife yeah. and I, well, we we all had a mutual friend um, uh, who was a printmaker to lots of stars like uh, Meyer, Joel Meyerowitz and Annie Leibovitz and, and, and others. And his name is Bob Korn, and he, and he still is a digital printmaker. Uh, out of East Ham, Mass. And anyway, we we were friends with Bob and Roland knew Bob too. And Bob said, can you help him, you know, with some of with, with some of his copyright issues and, and just help him organize his affairs better. And that's my area of expertise. So we put it together when we worked with Roland and uh, put together the compilation of images to basically tell the world, hey, listen, you know, here's Roland. Is, some of the stuff is his intellectual property. And um, you need to be aware of it because not only is there a copyright, but also there's a concept called moral rights. And moral rights exist that say artists like Roland um, have the right to have their work attributed to them, whether they own the copyright or not. And that's what Roland was referring to in terms of the government photograph. So the book, I think, has gone a long way, and Roland can speak to this, but I think it's gone a long way to bring attention to Roland's work, its historical significance, its cultural impact, resonates emotionally uh, on so many different levels, and uh, got the copyright to it. And listen, at the very least, you've got to give attribution. You've got to recognize Roland as the genius behind these images. You absolutely said it. It's iconic. It's definitive. It, it resonates culturally. Everybody uh emotionally can feel with it rolling in the i in the 60s documentary that was made just over 10 years ago uh you mentioned that you see light shining out of people um what was it about the era the, the 60s in particular that brought to you that that such a profound thought it's sort of a facile way of seeing <laughs> saying that i'm i'm a pretty good portraitist and and I, it's what I do. But the feedback I'm getting from the people I photograph said, "You've really captured me. That's really the way I see myself too." This is gee, how did you do that? You know. So, and I came up with a phrase that, that some people have light shining out of them, and it's a gift. And I'm really thank goodness for for this gift that I I get to see it a lot of times. I think the other gift that, that Roland sometimes undersells, um, he can be cantankerous and difficult to work with on occasion. However, he he's charming in many ways. And I think he relates to people. And I think people trust Roland. Um, there are so, in the book, there's so many fabulous images. But I love the story, Roland, about LBJ and why the the image, the picture you took of LBJ was the only one he ever liked. Well, uh, when Kennedy died and LBJ became the president, a lot of Peace Corps people were were uh, 
LBJ uh, friends, and they moved over to the White House from right across the Lafayette Park. And one guy was Lloyd Wright, a nice Texan guy. And the president, was Lyndon Johnson, was angry that there weren't good enough pictures of him. He didn't like the way he looked in pictures. And it was Lloyd Wright's job to get him, <laughs> get someone to make him look good. And I, he, they called me because I, he was a friend from the Peace Corps. And I came over to the White House, shoot, shoot, shoot. And all, I was doing the same st stuff because LBJ is 6'5". And uh, it looked, I, I, th I suppose... Lloyd Wright said he, he's getting what everybody else got. So Lloyd Wright stands up on the table and said, Mr. Pre and puts his hand in the air and said, Mr. President, will you look at my hand? And for that one second, beep, the LBJ looks up and the bang, that's the shot. And that picture turned out to be the official picture for the 64 campaign. It was, it was blown up to an immense size, maybe the biggest photo ever made at the, at the convention like 50 feet by 60 feet, you know, a huge blow up in the cover of his book. And and strangely enough, I learned later that that uh, Norman Mailer uh, reviewed the book and hated it, except for the cover. He said, if only, if only LBJ was like the picture on the cover, it would have been a much better book. <laughs> <laughs> I probably, we hung out with that mailer for a while and i only read that a few like a few months ago and i only wait a minute we could have talked we could have had a few laughs that's that's, that's funny good stuff it's uh you know the 60s i think um i don't know they, they stand out that that whole time period as being a very a, a new era right a very innovative time period a lot of change there's even change in technology um, that I think doesn't get as much scrutinized as it probably should. Um, but in that time, were you discovering new techniques or even new kinds of cameras that were helping you do your job better uh, in this throughout the sixties? Um, yeah. Um, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't as, I'm not a scientist. I, I really, I I, just, I love to work in a dark room, and I love the process of photography. But I'm really, I, I really never got into the you know. Some guys make their own film. I, I'm not in that <laughs> realm. So I realized early on that my first camera was a Nikon S2, which was like a a Japanese copy of the wonderful contacts that the Germans made that was so famous. But the Nikon made it a little better and little bells and whistles on it made it much better. And so I sort of got into the Nikon realm early. But my heroes were using Leica, so I, I switched to Leica's about know, halfway through. I think with each of the different, you know, I think of the movies, the the television shows, the the literature, the fashion, and of course music from the '60s. That there was a lot of people just like you who, uh, I suppose, you know, you could show the the Beatles that their amplifiers and their guitars were getting more advanced, but they weren't really too concerned with that. You know, they were more concerned what they could do with it. Um, I'm in the audio world and I talk to people all the time in the technical side of things. Well, it can get this many uh, beats per minute. I, I don't even know what they're talking about. I'm like, I'm just using it more as an art form than it is an actual technical thing. But would you say that that was the spirit of the 60s was using this new technology to be creative, to really pour out creativity in whatever you were uh, skilled in or interested in? Yeah, an interesting question, but it's also a, a double-edged sword because uh, we, were, <laughs> we were making uh, better stuff, but we're also making better weapons and we're using them on people. So that part of it was sort of scary. What, uh, uh, someone who reviewed a, my most recent show, the one in P-Town about the fact that I was shooting these pictures and, and making these images while the uh, 
Vietnam War was going on. And life asked me if I wanted to go to help cover the war. And I had just gotten married a couple of months before, so no, I didn't want to go. But I, I, that probably was a mistake because, you know, you have to pay your dues. But I, I could have... I could have stepped on a mine and never, never blown my ass off and never seen my wife again. You know, and it's one of those things. The answer to the question is, which I'm it's slipping away, but I know I was so I know I had a, a valid oh yeah. The horrifying things were going on at the time, and I was shooting some of them, you know, the marches and so forth. But all my pictures in the show, the portraits were people looking happy and having fun. And all the musicians, you know, it was, it was everything was sort of upbeat in my yeah. show. It, it, it seems like when I say I'm, I, I photograph light shining out of people, I also show, it seems like my stuff is always is good vibes. Yeah. A, a, I, a positive approach to the way things are and the way things look. And the more you show that, good. And even though the picture of the little girl, naked girl, her clothes were blown off by napalm and screaming, you know, the horrible pictures of that went on in the war, brilliant though they were, didn't stop the war. Right. And Life magazine ran page after page after page, picture, picture, dozens, hundreds of pictures of the guys that got killed in Vietnam that week, but it didn't really stop the war enough. What... <laughs> What did more to stop the war than anything I thought was John Lennon making full page New York Times pages of the war is over if you want it. Mm -hmm. so that kind of stuff. That guy really walked the walk as well as talk the talk. I mean, Frank Sinatra didn't take out full pages of <laughs> the war is over if you want it in the New York Times. Yeah. Positive, a positive stretch and a negative stretch in that in that whole period, and it's hard to like. But Roland, even your even the civil rights era, the March on Washington, um, it in so many of the images are both inspirational and reflective. Um, they they show the march, whether it was John Lewis, who you know, who I got to deal with in terms of, you know, a quote for the back of the book. And he was the last guy standing. The last guy standing. Yeah, for sure. But it talks, you know, you demonstrate their struggles and their achievement, but throughout it all, there's a sense of hope that it can get better and it will get better. Agre agreed. And, and that's, and that's the, like the, the JFK legacy. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country to make it a better place and a better right. world. Right. Right. Hey, Eric, I don't know if you know, you know, in the cover, I, I know you got 10 questions and you may only get three <laughs> on the Edith Lee Payne, but there's a wonderful story because you're somebody who teaches history, interested in history and the educational value of history. Well, why don't you share what we did at Denison? I think it was Black History Month, bringing, bringing Edith Lee Payne, this little girl and how you reconnected with her, what, 50 years later, I think on the anniversary of the March on Washington or thereabouts. Yeah. Um... A face in the crowd, absolutely beautiful face, which why why I, I focus on her for a couple of shots, only a couple of shots. And then when we edited the book, well, what's going to be the cover? It turned out to be her, and I think it it that that we made it we made a pretty good choice. That picture <laughs> she has become the poster child for the march now. It was when, yeah. she's, when she's in D.C. The the park rangers want to get her to to pose with them rather than the the, the tourists want to get their pictures taken with park rangers. The park rangers want to get their picture taken with Edith Lee Payne. This picture is on buses. It's on flags. It's all over D.C. When the when there's that kind of stuff is going on, and we were very proud of it. Edith Lee Payne herself has remained committed to the, the words of Dr. King as well and as wisely as anybody there has, has ever done. And uh, we, we all got to be pals uh, because at the 50th anniversary of the march, uh, the BBC found out who she was and found out who took the picture and got us together to be together at this march. And we've been pals ever since, uh, email, visited her in Detroit sometimes. The name of my podcast says exactly my point of view on things. Everything is a primary source. Everything is a document. And so just in that 
story. We have several, right? Like you documenting on August 28th, 1963. And then Michael, when you're sorting out the book saying, we're going to have the beginning and the end, you know, being bookended by the same story of two people meeting, but not meeting in 1963 and then reuniting and the setting itself, the national mall in the, the shadow of Abraham Lincoln and, you know, everything about the March on Washington was intentional and symbolic. And, you know, just the, I, I spend most of a class period with my class, with my students going through that, you know, where did they put the speaker stage? Where did the March actually go? Constitution Avenue, Independence Avenue. And where did it meet? Why not the Capitol steps? Why at Lincoln Memorial? What's the symbolism there? Um, and even just the the photograph itself, it you know the the pennant that she's holding indicates, I think, the same spirit of what you were doing there, in that it's a commemorative pennant. Pennant. It says, "I was there at the Lincoln Memorial for the March for Jobs and Freedom." And that's what you were doing there. That's why you were taking the pictures because your your audience wasn't necessarily the newspapers and the magazines in the 60s. It was meant for all time, correct? You were hoping that the future would look at this as well. I don't know whether they knew it was going to ever be that big. They were the uh, candidates, both Bobby and John were sort of afraid that there might be a riot. And so they were sort of dragged their feet about it, even having it. Finally, they got it okay. And uh, in the movie, the Chris Rito movie called I and the Sixth, well, one of the highlights of the film is that Dick Stolle, the editor of uh, People magazine and Life magazine, my bureau chief at the time, made a comment about that. Uh, oh my God, people are going to kill each other. But no, they're getting along, and they, they, that's why that was such an important time, an important vision. So, Michael, you've touched on this a little bit uh, already, but what motivated you to create the book itself? Was it the place of the same the same place as the I in the '60s uh, documentary has made a few years earlier? It it uh, no the the movie had absolutely no influence. So I I for the most part live a couple of different lives. The, the athletic life I you know had some you know pretty serious athletic achievements over my life, but art I live in the world of art. You know I study art. I've got more degrees than probably anybody you've ever met, and uh, uh, and I know a lot about art and artists and intellectual property. So. It's kind of been my life mission to help those artists that um, can't help themselves and roll and fell into that category. And I've worked with everybody from, you know, the Cuban Artists Rights Society and the Cuban government trying to get me to help them resurrect a copyright and probably the most reproduced image in the history of the world. Uh, and that's Che Guevara yeah. with with the, you know, the beret and uh, trying to <laughs> indicate to them that uh, following the life of uh, a, a guy named Alberta Corda, who was originally a fashion designer, photographer, and then came under the revolution, how that image got into the public domain. And the Cuban government just couldn't understand the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, but so, I mean, you name it. So from Cuba to, you know, uh, Arno Minkinen, who's Guggenheim, who's, you know, Guggenheim fellow and all that good stuff. Uh, all, all these artists, whether visual artists, fine artists, have issues, contract issues, copyright issues and things of that sort. And somehow they find me and I find them and, um, you know, for the most part, do it for gratis. What can I do to help you? To protect whatever your property interests are or commercial interests. Um, and so I met wonderful people literally throughout the world, including, you know, Roland. And we've become good friends over the years. And um, and I'm happy again to, to have his work recognized in the small part that my wife Christine and I have paid in in in, in that route.
can I ask, um, between the two of you, how did you settle on these 70 odd pictures? I mean, there's thousands. What was... We're going to have two different versions of this. Go ahead, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead. Okay. There's, a, right. lot of funny, there's a lot of funny there's side clips on this book, but. Yeah. Yeah, well, Roland probably realizes that weren't for my wife, Christine, this book would have never happened because we would have Roland over to our house with something to eat and drink and chat. And, you know, we would pick, he would pick out, these are the particular images. This is the story we want to tell. This is the chronology or whatever, whatever it was. And then next week he would come and he would say, well, who picked out these 70 images? And I said, Roland, you did. Oh, I would never have picked these 70. And this uh -huh. went back and forth all the time. And it was my wife, Christine, that says, no, 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 no. We're going to keep working this thing. I was ready to drop kick the whole project out. But um, that's just part of who Roland is and how you have to learn to roll with him. Uh, it's also his strength, too, at the same time. Well, uh, your side. My, my point of view, Christine and <laughs> And Michael, we're, we're editing this book with scissors and, and tape, and the computer never got into it. There was no digital anything. All that stuff, all that stuff went out with the with horse buggy whips. I mean, this this they were using like let's let's make a book. Yeah, but they didn't know what they were doing, and I guess we all uh, we had so it was a mutual. Collision of creative creative forces, and uh, I was complaining about it a lot, but it's in its second printing now. So many people like it. Yeah. I stopped complaining about it. Yeah, yeah. As it, hey, it out, it was, there were some delightful parts. I mean, working with Judy Collins to write the foreword was you know hysterical. Yeah, it. Yeah. Wait, and um, you know the blurbs. I mean, John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, the late Congressman Lewis. I I can't tell you um how emotional he was how thankful he was for roland for roland's work in in capturing you know that whole movement and the and the historical aspect and uh the the classy way that he depicted you know everything that took place um Is that you that got uh, john yeah, lewis to, to do the blurb on the back it was me yeah my compliments, because I got to meet him, and and uh, I, we hit it off. He is a he was a wonderful guy to hang around, and yeah, absolutely, yeah. So me, so you know, I, I mentioned before, I mentioned both of you that you know my parents are they're of that generation. They grew up in the sixties. They were teenagers in the sixties. When I shared this book with them recently, they loved it. They were just so happy to look at it, and it brought back so many memories and gave us each opportunities to talk about what do you remember of these things? You know what what and you know over the years they've shared, you know when it when things come up, you know where they were when different things happened and and so forth. But um, was that? I, I know that it, it was made mostly to get Roland the proper recognition for his work. But was there any part of uh, this for memory, memorializing, nostalgia for an era? Uh, did that factor in at all to, to making the book um, and maybe even preserving it for future generations in any way? Every photographer I've ever known wants a book. I mean, I mean some guys do like 30 books, but all... Uh, all guys who make images, in fact, most artists would like to have their stuff blast and have a wider, the widest possible audience as can. And then book is a terrific way to do it. I was, I, you know, made a couple of books of my own in the past, but this was a, like a retrospective of my work, and I'm really, really, really happy to have it. Yeah, I think the book reflects the arc of living history, of Roland's living history with the historical events and cultural events and social events that took place during that time. And Roland, I mean, you got to talk about the Beatles. You talk about iconic cultural events. And uh, 
Uh, and how? Oh, so, yeah, the people keep saying I'm the Forrest Gump of photography. I always show up in the places where you know, all of a sudden, <laughs> something magic is happening. You know, it was just just lucked out. Well, my sister was assisting the Beatles' personal photographer, a guy named Robert Freeman, and she called up and said, "You might, you might as well come down here. These guys are big." And I think I, I had heard their records because she had sent them to me, so I knew what was happening. But I didn't realize that I didn't have a ticket. I didn't have a press pass. You know, I was it wasn't even. Uh, well, 64, I think I'd finished my gig with the Peace Corps. I was freelancing, and so I just got in there and started shooting pictures, and nobody stopped me, so I got a little closer. Still nobody stopped me. By, by the time I was on my last roll of film, I guess I had five or six rolls, and I blew it all from so far away that you can't see anything. But the last roll of film, I had my elbows on the stage, and like right next to it. It was just a... And my sister, keep, every time she sees one of the pictures, she said, you owe me a bottle of champagne because I got you into that. Yeah. I got you into the, got yeah. you into the Beatles. And it turns out, you know, like that it was their first gig in the States, the first live concert in the States. So historically that way as well. Yeah. For yeah. That was Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump indeed. Yeah, yeah. So Eric, that was right after the Ed Sullivan show. So they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show in New York. And no went to Carnegie DC. Hall, right? Yeah, we took a train down from the from New York to D.C. Yeah. But one of my favorite images in the book related to the Beatles is when Roland was right next to the stage, you know, filming the Beatles. And then he turns around and he gets these screaming girls. And one woman has a little button. I don't know if you can quite see it in the book. It says, I love the Beatles, but spells the word Beatles <laughs> wrong. It was so early in the game. They could... <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that whole uh that tour was so revolutionary and you were mentioning how you, you were able to get so close to the stage. I mean, that wouldn't even happen a year later. They wouldn't, or maybe even later in the tour, it wouldn't have happened. I've got another little snippet about that for you, Eric. The, uh, sure. the Beatles are important because when they showed up in the, in America, was it in February in 64? Yeah, yeah. That's when that concert was. It was the one thing that knocked the gloomy JFK assassination headlines off the front page. All of a sudden, it wasn't, you know, it was gloomy anymore. Music, fabulous, fans going wild, fun, and so forth like that. It changed the whole sort of, it took away the gloomy perspective that, that, that Americans had about life. And then they started realizing that, Sure enough, life goes on, and it's we should enjoy as as much as we can, as best we can from now on. I think that, and this is, I think, an appropriate time to ask about the power of photography in all of this, because yes, the '60s had, by that point, nearly all the same kinds of media that we have now, minus computer stuff, um, but. This, we still have so many photographs from that era, many of them yours, that are still so powerful. And you were just mentioning about the, the Kennedy assassination and the funeral, that, that famous photograph from Life magazine of John F. Kennedy Jr. saluting his father. That was just a few months before the Beatles showed up, like you yeah. say, and, and change everything. Um, why is it that what is the power of the the single static image that is that you can't take away from it motion pictures can't really even uh compete with it what is what is the power of photography the fact that the image is um is is not flickering and it's not changing it, it, uh, it was written by photo photo scholars that the camera sees better than the eye because it freezes the image and you can get let your eye roam around it much better than you can even in real life. No. So that's one thing. And I the uh, USAA this is interesting. USAA made a movie of the march, and it's not not very good. But then there it is, moving pictures of stuff. They, they, I don't know what their story was, but they didn't, uh, they, they weren't where I was. They just photographed 
snippets of speeches and in snippets of images of people walking around, but it wasn't and to look at it, even if it was excellently done, it it it, it never gets shown. It, my, the, the pictures I did are can go in magazines, can go in books, and it's part of an education. You can't do that with the movie so much as you can with a still image. I I think what um the single shot image is able to do is it create it it captures the humanity of the subject without the need for sound or words. It just speaks for itself. The good ones speak for itself. You don't need anything more than that. You don't right. need somebody to illustrate it, detail it, explain it. It's there. You capture that. Mm -hmm. When you see in the book, some of the images of like Arthur Ashe and, and Roland spent a, a week or so traveling with him, they just speak for themselves. His elegance, he's not even on the tennis court and you can see his elegance. And yet he's, engaging in the simple little non-pleasure that all of us have to do and that is we've got to do our laundry yeah it's such a and this particular photograph is just absolutely perfect for my my next question and is there a line between as a photographer and just in photography and i'd love to hear both of your input on this um being descriptive and prescriptive. In other words, when does a photographer go from being just documenting to then storytelling? I, I don't philosophize it that way. To me, it, to, to me, it was just doing a job. I, you know, there's this kid, there's this black kid. He's winning tennis matches. We want you to go photograph him and see what he's like. So I go and photograph him and see what he's like, and he, he he's the real deal. It wasn't, yeah. I didn't make any, I didn't add anything to this guy. I was just capturing some of the positive aura that he's putting out, the grace and the, the way he handled himself. A, you know, a black guy that's beating everybody in tennis and he's in playing in Texas and there's no black people in the audience anywhere and, and not even allowed in the damn country club where he's playing, that kind of thing. He handled all that as well as he, as well as, Jackie Robinson handled his baseball career. Yeah. And that's why they built this, the, a tennis stadium. The, the best tennis stadium in the world is named after him because he uh, he added to the, what is it? The living up to the humanity that we all should strive for, that kind of thing. Or it was yeah. just doing the right thing, being the right person. But I suppose, you know, the, where I was going with it actually goes really well with the the picture on the opposite page is this one of him playing tennis is could be just seen as documenting him as a tennis player. It's identifying him with what he does, but then the one with him doing his laundry, this one tells a story, it, you know, and it's like that. It's funny. I, you should pick out that, 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 that spread because sport photography is damned hard. And I've watched him play tennis for hours and hours. And I, that might be one of the three any good picture. <laughs> you know, sporting, it's a whole different realm. Fashion photography and middle of, I guess my, my what's the word? Gist, gist, gist is portraiture. I'm mostly a portrait making guy. And uh, doing the job was making him look and the way he does and, and show him the way I felt about him. Hey, Eric, here's, here's my analogy. Uh, you know, yeah, I'd like to hear that. As Roland knows, and a lot of people know, I have a pretty extensive sports background, been around a lot of great athletes, teammate of Spitz in 72 and all that good stuff. And um, the great ones, and I've known Michael Phelps since he was, you know, a tot. Um, the great ones make it look easy. <laughs> you know, even though we know there was a lot of work to get from point A to yeah. point B. R Roland's, the picture's, look like this is easy but the genius behind it whether it's capturing shadows or backgrounds or or just accidental he makes look easy um and that distinguishes the great ones from the rest of us yeah because I, there's plenty of photographers that work for newspapers that just take a picture of yeah. a parade going by and it looks like 
literally anybody could have taken that picture. Yeah, it doesn't have any meaning. There's no it's concept. Just, There's right, nothing it's just documenting. It. But yeah. then you have something like this one, which... Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, that's you one of my the, favorite portraits. I love it. And that's an important picture. Lower the the viewfinder a little bit. One, one snap. Totally different picture. It's not click, 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 and get a thing. But just passing through, there he is. I knew he was the guy that whose idea it was. You got to get a picture of him. You know, you're covering it for USIA. There he is, all by himself in front of the Lincoln. You know how how could you miss? You know, but I was Forrest Gump. You know, <laughs> lucky to be there. I think finally, this is this is my last uh, question. I actually have two last questions. Uh, we've already touched on one of them, which is of this collection, which one's your favorite? So we just did that. So, uh, but we haven't heard from Michael yet. What's a, what's your, mine is Arthur Ashe doing his laundry. Roland's is of uh, A. Philip Randolph in front of Lincoln. Yeah. Do you have a favorite, Michael, of, of this collection? Yeah, I I, you know, maybe maybe two, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about Arthur Ashe. We got to meet uh, Arthur's uh, wife. Uh, Roland knew her beforehand, but Christine and I did when we had a, an opening, uh, actually with the associated with the book at the Leica Gallery in New York City. That may not be the right name, but we got to meet her and her kids. And in one of my teaching gigs, I, I think it was at Bentley University, I had uh, a, a one or two students, and Arthur was their uh, uh, not official grandparent, but Arthur helped raise them, the Ash family. So you know, it's one of those full circle kinds of things that gives more meaning to it, and as an athlete, can appreciate you know what it takes to become great. But maybe the Edith Lee Payne, you know, uh, the cover one is just mm -hmm. because there's so much history. Well, we we started talking about historical events. And so um, after Edith and Roland got together on the anniversary, uh, which was the last image in, in the book, um, I think it was Black History Month at Denison University, Granville, Ohio, where I graduated and lots of other family members. Um, we, we had a sort of a civil rights showing and Edith came and and you know talked about her life and and what 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 all this meant to her and Roland did and we had the Black Student Union and all kind of administrators and faculty and students fabulous event Roland spoke to classes I think I spoke to one of the classes too um, and that that stuff resonates it just it gives meaning to everything so I would say this is it yeah I, I guess it was kind of a silly question on my part because since you edited this. And you selected that for the cover. That would be your favorite, if okay. any any of the other ones. Um, my my last question is: Would our understanding as a society of the 1960s be complete without the photography of Roland? Where do these photographs land among all the other documentation of that time period? I wouldn't go far as to say that. that I I had more pictures in Life magazine in the last couple of years of the 60s <laughs> but a lot of them were like senator schmear case shaking hands with 16 left-handed boy scouts from des moines or something <laughs> like that a lot of the stuff you know it wasn't earth-shattering stuff you're just doing the job you're a freelance you're as good as your last job and you know they call up and you life magazine says go here and get that and you do and that that's the makes the job of it but there, there are some really heavy hitters out there in the 60s besides me. I mean, I mean, beyond me. And a couple of them got killed in Vietnam. You know, these wonderful, brilliant journalists got blown away in Vietnam. And some guys are still around and were retired or died natural causes. But it's a whole different ball game I and mean, a whole different episode of your show to to to, to list list them. And my advanced age and my memory is so shot that I can hardly remember names anymore, but Dennis Stock is one of them. 
Philly Polsman is another one. And of course, the great fashion photographers, Avedon and Penn and those guys, the whole pantheon of wonderful photographers that aren't with us anymore, mm -hmm. I guess, make up the the 60s. But now, it's, in as much as everyone has one of these and every day a billion photographs are made or more. Yeah. And people say, well, none of them are any good. Well, let's say only 10% are good. That's still a hundred thousand or a hundred million great photographs that are being taken every day. It's going on and on. It's just the the sixties were great. It seemed like there would be the it would be a, a beginning of peace, but then again, the Vietnam War was going on too. So, but yeah, I think I think you just, you know to I don't I I don't think any of us can do justice to the question, but I think you just have to look at it in the context of the times. And so again, here's my athlete uh, analogy. Um, you know, Spitz was the best ever in the in the late '60s and '70s, and Michael Phelps was the best ever in his era. But there are plenty of other great athletes. Um, that were just a millisecond behind both of them. Yeah. Some of it are just accidents of history, to be honest with you. I mean, Spitz fell on his face in 68, um, thought he'd never come back in 72, won his first race, got his confidence, and then won six more. Roland's one of many, you know, uh, that that have their place and to be recognized. And, I, you know, I, I, do, I don't even get a hold of Roland every time we see his work someplace, but my wife and I, we travel a lot, get a lot of museums, and there are plenty of museums where when they have photography exhibits that we see Roland's work on the wall, and and that probably speaks for itself. And so, and the fact that you and your students recognize and your parents recognize the value, that that's that's what's important. It doesn't matter where he fits on the list. He's yeah, he's good, great for what he what he did and when he did it and how he did it. I suppose that's just my awkward way of saying that he, and to, to end as we started, he did do these things. These are his photographs. And if he hadn't taken them, yeah, we would be without that many, we'd have that fewer documents of an era that was so visual, you know, that we, we need so many uh, uh, artifacts to, to piece together from. So, there are a lot of guys shooting besides me, but apparently what they all wanted was to get pictures of Martin Luther King. They didn't seem to think there was, you know, the faces in the crowd or things. Some did, some didn't. I, I had a little by a bad said official photographer March in Washington. I could go anywhere. I had this unbelievable access to anything. I went up to the top of the uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial and shot that snap. There were guys whose position was there, and that's the only place they were that whole day. You know, and I was just—I had a, the entree of a lifetime. It's, I, I could just hang out with with the, with the movie stars, that, you know, shoot in their faces. I could go anywhere, do anything. I, it was a gift. I should have paid them to make me do it. <laughs> but I was a hungry, young, ambitious photographer, and I worked my tail off that day, and and I. I I didn't know it was going to be that big, but once I saw that it was and that important, I worked extra hard. And I worked from like eight in the morning to eight at night and did the whole thing, never stopped. Didn't stop for lunch, nothing. Shoot, 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 climb, climb, walk, walk, shoot, shoot, walk. Turned out the way it turned out. I was gift. I was a gift. Well, we appreciate the gift that you gave us. So, well, thanks uh, for having us on. Yeah. Eric. No, it, it's been a wonderful time talking with you and, uh, and, you know, this is, I think, a, a wonderful way to end the the season of my podcast, where we talk primary sources. That's what it's all about. So, thank you again. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. What a way to cap off season three of the Everything Is a Primary Source podcast. It was an absolute honor and pleasure to speak with both Roland and Michael, two makers and stewards of historical documents. Season three has been a great one for the EPS podcast. This show began as an extension of my classroom method, but has since transformed into an oral history recording platform and now an open source collaborative hub for students and teachers. Be sure to visit everything-history.com 
to learn how you can take part in learning and teaching history through pop culture. I post regularly on Instagram, even between seasons. So make sure you search everything as a primary source and follow the program there. We'll be back with even more of your reactions to and relationships with artifacts of everyday life in a few months. But until then, this has been the EPS Podcast, where everything is a primary source.